Welcome, and thanks for joining me today on Mortgage Manager Playbook, a podcast for sales leaders who want to improve their team's sales performance and originate more loans. I'm Pat Sherlock, your host. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive on what makes a successful broker. And this is really an important topic, especially since the industry is shifting. And I have the perfect expert, Catherine Gardner. Catherine is well known in our industry. She's very famous. She currently is uh, SVP at Open Mortgage. Before that, she was at ARC Home and Pacific Union before that. Hi, Catherine. Hi. It's great to see you. Well, this is, uh, I think, a really important topic because obviously we're seeing a shift in the industry from, and uh, there was a period where we had, I think, almost 50,000 brokers. And I think that when you look at the options for a loan officer, becoming a broker is really a viable strategy for them. So, So let's take a dive on, and you've seen big guys, small guys, all kinds. And what is it that you think is important that makes it successful? I do think it's a great topic. And, you know, those shifts that we have seen in the industry are pretty dramatic over the COVID mm-hmm. and post-COVID years. So, you know, the the broker uh, is one of those places where you can say, you know, size doesn't matter. In my mind, in my heart, the what makes a truly successful broker a good broker, and I'm really speaking about broker, not an IMB or you know, a small correspondent, but a true broker, it, it comes down to the three C's, you know, curiosity, clarity, and community. And when I see those traits in a broker, I'm excited about getting to be a partner with them. So Catherine, since you mentioned the three C's, I'm, I'm curious about curiosity. And <laughs> so talk about that one. What that's, What does that mean? I mean, to me, it means that desire for, for lifelong learning, and, you know, mm-hmm. broker who can, who has that trait innately and infuses that in their culture, you know, that's someone I'm excited about partnering with. And the reason being is, you know, I think it, it does a few things for them. One, the curious people, they stay current. They find that balance of being informed on economic trends, potential product changes. They, they set aside time for that on a regular basis. I think curious people too are just natural problem solvers. And mm-hmm. certainly, you know, we're, we're solving people problems with, with products all the time. And so marrying the, the people problem or the opportunity that's in front of them with products, they need to be curious and staying informed and up to date on the products that are available. And then the last thing I just think, you know, curious people are adaptable. And that's probably my favorite thing about brokers is, you know, if we look back at what's gone on in the the years of my career, the adaptability of the mortgage broker is, you know, there should be lots of case studies on it. The broker is just so adaptable. They've moved through an environment of limited regulation to extreme regulation, Mm -hmm. to growth, to consolidation, to being having a desire to have 50 lender partners to maybe working with three lender partners, you know, whatever the the market is calling them to. I think those great curious brokers are are looking for the path that suits them. So when I see someone that's curious and that wants to invest time, but has the balance of clarity with who they are, again, I think they're a great partner. So Catherine, the the ones that fail, that they jump off into the broker world, what's that look like? And I know you're going to talk about the other two things, but I'm curious about the failure side. What ends up happening? I, I think so many things can happen. It, it is difficult as, as that, especially if you're trying to do a ground up build as a broker, uh, you're trying to do business and build a business at the same time. And it's incredibly challenging. Although I think easier now with technology than it was in the past. But I, I do think that what happens is we lose their way. If you don't know, and this gets a little bit into that clarity piece, what your strengths are, mm-hmm. really who you want to be as an originator or a broker and what your real strengths are. And you can't move within that clarity and create a consistent, repeatable process for your referral sources the right. strong communication, you know, the competition is just too great. And the, comp- the competition will win on a consistent, repeatable process with strong communication. And when I see, when I see those failures, 
I think there's there's investment in the wrong places, maybe where the company isn't strong. And if they're trying to grow into something, the resourcing and the investment that is needed is often not there. So if they go out and buy a jet, you know that's a problem. <laughs> it could be a problem. <laughs> yeah. it could be a problem. So talk about the other C's. You talked about clarity now and also curiosity. The third C. I'll, can, I'll say one more thing about clarity because it, it reminds me of my, my mom, you know, would send us out the door and she would say, remember who you are, you know, remember who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think what the market has done to some of even the great brokers, right, over the last few years is it's made them question who they are, what their strength is, because it has been so challenging. But those that I, you know, saw survive and thrive through this kind of post-COVID area, they really had a confidence and clarity on their strengths, their why, and how they wanted to work in their market. And that enabled them to execute on focused marketing, uh, mm -hmm. really target their audience in meaningful ways, and again, find solutions to problems, even when the, the opportunity for refinances and things was so diminished. So... So when you think about the role of the investor, certainly what I've seen over the years, and I'm interested in your thoughts, is that the investor has certainly now become more active with the broker. In other words, providing marketing, things that they never used to provide in the past. I mean, in the past, it was like, you're on your own, you have to do something. And, and so how do you see that all? It's almost like investors are looking at it as a distributed retail strategy in many ways, where they're providing the market. They're, they're so much more involved. And how do you see that playing out in the future? It, it is really interesting. I mean, again, especially for a, a smaller broker, you know, to have a graphic design capability or even mm -hmm. basic creation, you know, unless you've got a canvas, Canva master in your house, you know, it, it is challenging. So I do think that investors have tried to be supportive, especially with connecting how products, the persona of a product, you know, with that ultimate borrower and helping the broker make that connection clearly. And I think also the investors want to make sure that the product is presented correctly because it's an intense regulatory environment. And I think there's a, there's a high level of accountability right now. You, you need to make sure that you can do what you said you could do. And so I think that took investors down that path. I mean, your, your comment about distributed retail, <laughs> certainly I think there, there are some models that, that feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I would encourage brokers that really engage in that type of model just to stay curious and to, to keep asking themselves, is this partner, am I getting too singular with any one partner, right? Am I, am I staying curious? Am I keeping clear on what I want to be and how I want to engage here in my community and what I want to represent? Mm -hmm. um, because, you, you know, you, I think the heart and soul of a great broker is independence. And if, if it wasn't, you know, they probably would engage fully in distributed retail. So... It, I don't know how it's going to play out, though, Pat. I mean, that it will be interesting to see how it will play out in the future. Are there legal ramifications? I don't know. There was certainly a buzz about that a while ago, but it seems to have calmed down. So what what is the situation now? In the past, it used to be that a broker would have 10 investors and something like that. But what, what's it look like now? And are they willing to actually have that many investors? I feel like it's really changed. I mean, I, when I started out as a, as a broker, I remember one of the first things I was tasked with, with doing when I started working at Roswell Mortgage Services in Georgia was to go through the 70 plus relationship that we had and determine oh, wow. who we had delivered a loan to in the last three years. And, and, you know, we, we, we had a good group of loan officers that did use a lot of different lenders, but it was about 20. That, that I think mm -hmm. that we had, you know, delivered loans to. I think with with technology, just from a processing and support staff, you know, it's it's hard to ask your processor to learn five, six, seven, eight different right. courses. 
it, it really is. And so I think processors and support staff have had a little bit more of a voice to say, hey, do we really need to add a new investor? Can we not solve that here with what we have? So I, I think the number has come down. However, um, as always with the slowdown, that curiosity goes up. How can I replace some of this refinance income? And so um, people have been jumping out and looking at more niche products and how can they serve different segments of their community and do they have the right products for all of the segments of the community? So I felt like over the last two or three years, we've expanded again, maybe maybe to the bane of, of some processing staff, but you know they've, they've really recognized that, hey, we do need to have more relationships because we need to have a broader touch within our local community to really serve. So what percentage typically of uh, brokers are like one man shops or one women shops? And what percentage of them are, you know, in essence, uh, you know, much larger in that five to 10 employee range? Or what does the breakdown actually look like? I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the, the true breakdown is. And then I should do that analysis probably. I have become very engaged in uh, data down at the account level and not so much at the, at sure. the macro. But that is, that is a good question. I certainly there are, I, I feel like more mega brokers than we've ever seen before. And I feel like the the small, but but there's certainly been a growth and a transition into brokering in a way that we haven't seen before. And a lot of that is the one or two loan officer thing. So I wonder if we aren't a little bit barbelled with the very small broker and the mega broker. Yeah, right. And so it raises the question, and I know just from some of my friends that are in the third party space that they talk about how you know, when they have a list of accounts and really just like you were talking about, you know, a lot of the investors aren't getting any business. And it's so the issue is, you know, is that is the strategy or the better strategy, sign them up and hope something happens? Or is it, okay, we're going to sign them up and we're going to work with a smaller number? What is the current thinking in the third party world? I think that the current thinking is you need to be present and aware and have create awareness. So as a, a lender investor, you need to make sure that you have a strong marketing presence and that you're engaged in the broker segments that you want to be in um, and that you're building relationship. I think there's been a movement away from just sign them up and hope. Yeah. Um, I think there's really been a, Let's create awareness so that mm -hmm. when uh, a broker is ready to engage with us, it's because we've provided meaningful materials. If we didn't have that true relationship with them, you know, if we didn't have the opportunity to know them and they're reaching out to us or reacting and engaging with marketing and we're able to respond in a meaningful way and then really engage pretty quickly in the transaction. So... And when you're looking at also how you interact, we've had the traditional AE runs around with their famous number of uh, brokers. And obviously we've seen some, some large companies do it as a call center. And then we see it in the field mode. What's your thoughts about that? Can we, can we actually handle having an AE cover just a certain area versus we need to do a call center? I, I mean, I would I would lean towards a third option, which is that you have AEs who are actively engaged in the field, but it's relationship driven. Mm -hmm. So, and and you know, there's some there's some potential cost to that if you have an AE in in Tennessee, you know, that has a strong relationship with customer in Iowa. But I think that that it should be relationship driven. We're a very mobile world now. Brokers are moving. Uh, people have certainly moved out of their geography. I don't see a lot of success in models that tie account executives to geography or zip codes or area codes or major MSAs. Relationships have just gotten too diverse. So balancing that, right? So time in the in the office and being available via email, phone, Teams, Zoom with 
okay, these are key accounts and I need to make sure several times a year that I'm physically present with them in ways that matter. So maybe that is in one of their forums or I'm helping them present to their referral sources. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, you know, just, just showing up and making sales calls does still have value. And, And I think good salespeople bring education and value, but really engaging in meaningful ways to help that broker drive referrals uh, is certainly more valuable. And, and I hope that's never lost because the great account executives in the market are so skilled at it. Mm-hmm. So in the past, there's been different attempts like to have a broker university to actually show how to become self-employed because as you said, it's not easy. <laughs> it definitely is not easy. And so, and selling by itself isn't easy, but having your own business isn't. Do you see that coming back or, or what are your thoughts on that? I'd love to see it come back. Sure. Um, I, it's costly. It's time consuming and there's so much to learn in our business. Um, I still see a lot of the kind of working under the arm of someone else as the most most common path. Um, mm-hmm. But the need for education is is real. I think one of the great things that the lenders and investors do on the account executive side is they do do a lot of investing in program training and product training and presentation training to really help bring to market to that broker base those tools. How do we then create that education? I mean, so you certainly do. You certainly bring education to mm-hmm. the market. How do we do that at a broader perspective? I don't know. Well, it's a challenge, that's for sure. But if you have to look at to like 2025 and the next few years, it's my perception that there will be a, a large growth in the broker world because companies are coming back and they've now found that refis don't come that easily <laughs> as they used to. Um, is that how you're seeing it? I do. Um, I think about all the, you know, I mean, maybe that's a good segue into the last one of community too, but if you think about all the loan officers that have left the business, sure, um, there's so many, you know, if you say uncovered or unserved borrowers from that had relationships with loan officers that are no longer in the business. Right. And so there's great opportunity there. There's so much opportunity. And I think, you know, in, in relation to being really in your community, We use those terms, we use the term underserved or we use the term niche, but we have the Hispanic borrowers as the largest percentage of first time home buyers. We are reaching that date rapidly. Mm -hmm. And there is still so little representation. There are a lot of organizations that are now getting really serious about developing products that uh, really can help homeownership in those underserved communities. And I think, again, you know, who adopts those first? The self-employed, the independent mortgage broker who finds that product and knows best how to solve Mm -hmm. a problem for people um, within their local community. So you're pretty bullish on the broker world in the next few years, for sure. Yeah, I am. I, uh, I think the broker world is Again, I go back to that adaptability. It'd be hard for somebody to to tell me they're not going to survive because when you think about going through HVCC, the air compliance, TRIB, you know, all these things that people predict that this will be the end of the broker. Well, guess what? (laughs) Exact opposite. LO compensation rules. This will be the end of uh, LOs being able to earn a living. Exact opposite. The adaptability of this group is is phenomenal. That's really a good point. And so we only have a few minutes left. If you'd like to like give a couple of takeaways for our listeners today, stay curious, my friends. <laughs> yeah, I would say that that's really you know important. And it, and one other thing I would say is you know remember who you are. There you, you talk to people in the industry. There's a, there's a little bit of life now, right? There's a little bit of joy, a little bit of hope with with rates starting to trickle down. You know, grab on to that. Remember who you are. Don't sell scared. You know who you are. You know how to do what you do really well. Look back at what you've done. 
and, you know, go deeper into your community, um, be present, you know, be a good citizen yeah. and engage. Wow, they're, they're rules to live by. So, Catherine, how can anybody get a hold of you because you're a, a fountain of information about the third-party space and mortgage lending? Thank you. I, um, I'm available anytime. I've had the same cell phone number for 25 years, so I'm going <laughs> to give it up. That's okay with you, Pat. I give it. 3, <laughs> 303-589-2227. I love to talk. I'm curious about what someone might call me to talk about. And uh, or email uh, open wholesale. I'm at open wholesale, and uh, my email is Catherine Gardner, no dot in there, at openwholesale.com. So. And you're on LinkedIn, so that's I'm a good on LinkedIn. One. Yeah, yes. she's active with it too. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your wisdom, and I want to thank our listeners for listening today on this important topic. And certainly, if you would like to listen to some other topics, certainly go to patrolock.com. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mortgage Manager Playbook. You can catch up on all our episodes by subscribing to receive each week a new show. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends and team members. If you're looking to increase production, call me to discuss my prospecting sales training program, Ramping Up Realtor Referral Sources. Check out my website, www.patsherlock.com.